so like I love that framework for like how do you create wealth with the four fours. It's so simple and it's really nice to have a stake in the ground as well. You know, I think like there's not leaning on Kiyosaki here again. There's not much financial education, you know, in schools, it's obviously not there. Our parents don't teach us heaps. My financial education from my dad was if you can't afford something, here's a credit card, you know, use, use, a, use a credit card for it because if you don't have the money, then the credit card has the money right now. And taught me plenty of good lessons. That was one of the dysfunctional ones. And, and yet, you know, when we think about like, I want to get rich or I want to build wealth, it's like, well, what does that even look like? What does that number look like? And just understanding the basics of, okay, well, if you have a fund of $4 million and that's returning, for, well, it's returning, let's say it's returning 7 or 8%, like you can draw down a certain amount of that, whether it's 3% or 4% per year, you can draw that down and the fund never shrinks. Um, so that's, it's just such a, a beautiful concept there. And, you know, depending on what you're comfortable to live on, and there's different cities and different places in the world where living in a different area is going to be very different in terms of what you actually need to live on and what your desires are. My desires are pretty simple. Like, yeah, I like, I like to shop in the macro aisle at Woolworths, but apart from that, I don't have any particular expensive habits apart from cars. But for me, like my life is pretty simple. I don't drink, I don't smoke, you know. And so for me, there's not much in terms of like outgoings that go out, but I really, really optimize my time. And so when I've got that income built and I've now got the business system that is well optimized, for me, it's like, okay, cool. Where else can I optimize my time? I have someone who comes to my house and does the laundry and then folds the laundry and then literally puts it into the cupboards in my home. And the reason for that is because that's something that I've now decided to delegate that so I can spend more of my time doing the things that I love with the people I love and more bandwidth for projects that I can actually be a part of that are exciting to me. And we were talking in the pre-show about a new business that I've become involved in. And with that business, you know, I just wouldn't be able to serve that business or jump into a functional role in that business if I didn't have the amount of spaciousness in my time available. But we've talked a lot about time. I want to come back to strategies for improving profit and strategies yes. for cash flow. That's what we promised. So let's talk about that. Let's let's get into the practical stuff of like, okay, you're a business owner. It's end of financial year time. You might not be able to get all this done by June 30, and that's okay. But can you make this part of your strategic plan and the habits that you start to build for what the next financial year actually looks like for you? And Jackson, I'd love to hear. Take us take us away yeah. with some of the top strategies for more profit, more cash. Well, here's the thing. There's a phenomena that you probably experience as a business owner, which you're going to have a conversation with your accountant over the course of the next few weeks or maybe the next couple of months, depending on how proactive your accountant is. And they're going to sit down with you with your financial statements and they're going to say, hey, Peter, here's your profit and loss and here's your financials for the year. Congratulations, you've made all of this profit. And typically speaking, you're going to either say, well, where is it? It's nowhere to be seen. Or maybe you haven't had a great year because of COVID or other situations that have occurred. But what we often find is that there is a big disconnect between the money that you've made on paper and the money that exists in your business bank account. And what you've got to realize, guys, is that your accounting is done based on really complex accounting principles, which should really mean nothing to you as a business owner. As a business owner, the only thing that matters is cash. And it was famously said, Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, but cash is king. Mm. And the big issue is what I see with most business owners is that they don't have the level of transparency and understanding of their business model and how they convert their activity into income. Mm. And this comes down to a basic fra framework that most business owners operate out of one or two bank accounts. And we call mm. it the single account sinkhole. They've got one account where all the money comes into and then all the expenses come out of their bills and their rent and their wages and super and tax and all of these things. And maybe if they're, they're really good, they might have a tax account where they're putting money aside for tax and GST. But it's so hard to keep the finger of the pulse. And the analogy that I like to use is Christmas dinner, right? Like let's assume that you were sitting around with your family having Christmas dinner and there was a turkey that was sitting on the middle of the table or a ham or a lamb or whatever it is that your family eats. And you decided to get up and start carving off pieces of that, that turkey and putting it straight into your mouth. Like what's your, what's your mum or your auntie or whoever it is that's the, the kind of the, the outly spoken person in your family gonna say, Pete, what, if you did that, what would they say? Uh, get the F out of the house. <laughs> exactly. It's bad manners, right? You just don't mm. do it. But mm. as a business owner, that is the exact same thing that you're doing with your cash flow. You are eating mm. from the serving plate. Mm. So. 
what do we do? Well, much like at Christmas dinner, we have eating plates. Everyone has their own plate where you cut off your portion and then you serve it all out. And we need to set up the eating plates in our business. So mm. typically, the first eating account is going to be your cost of sales account. If you run a, say, a, a business that has materials or subcontractors or inventory, mm. we want to make sure that we carve off that piece because it is the most sensitive piece to the production of revenue and profitability because it's directly proportionate. Let's carve that piece off first. That leaves us with what we call real revenue or what your accountant might call gross profit. And then we've got four other buckets that we can put money into. One is operating expenses. Two is owner's pay. Three is tax. And four is profit. Now, OPEX is basically all of the fixed costs that you have in your business. Salaried employees, your wage, your rent, utilities, all of that stuff. Owner's pay is paying your number one employee, which is you. Stop allowing your accountant to convince you to take 30 grand a year out of your business for tax minimization. Your accountant is ensuring that you retire poor as a result of you following that advice. Yeah. So and we're going to talk about that. Next is tax. Let's make sure we put money aside to keep the tax man at bay, keep them happy. And lastly, put money aside for profit. Because as a business owner, you wear two hats. You work in your business and you should be paid as an employee, should be paid a market income for that role but you should also be paid as a shareholder because you take a lot of risk. You, you alluded to this before, Pete, that business is risky. So imagine that you own shares in a, in a company and every single year they sent you a notice saying, sorry, Pete, we've suspended the dividend. We're not paying it out this year because we're tipping it back into the business, but they're not producing, the business isn't growing. They're just burning all of the cash. At what point in time are you going to start getting the shits and say, hey, where's my profit check? Yep. And by the way, why am I being underpaid as, a, as an employee? <laughs> exactly. Mm. So you're doing yourself a disservice. And, and the, the key thing here is, guys, that this, the problem is that you're robbing Peter to pay Paul because of this single account sink colon. By setting up these serving plates, by setting up these buckets in your business, it results in what we refer to as a come to Jesus moment. You're going to have an oh shit moment where you're using one bucket to compensate for another, it's going to give you clarity and you're going to be able to address the issues as they present themselves. And it's going to help you with a really simple behavioral principle called Parkinson's law. Because as a human being, we use the means we have available. As our business grows, unless we have these serving plates in place and these eating plates in place, our use of those means is going to increase proportionately and sometimes in excess of the new income that we have. So yeah. if we and it's kind of like running means, off butt numbers, right? It's like, oh, I think I'll need this, so I'll go ahead. Oh, I think this marketing strategy might work, so I'll go ahead. And it's kind of like going off the vibe and maybe you've had a couple of customers pay their bills and so the bank balance is nice and healthy and maybe you're a little yeah. bit slow on paying some of the, you know, the bills out. And so you make the decision just based on what's you know, there. And that's kind of like, to use your analogy, like looking at the turkey and going, oh, that looks really juicy. There's heaps for everyone. I'll just go ahead and have a bite. <laughs> exactly right. And this is an absolute game changer. It's a really simple framework. And we've used this with thousands of businesses now to help them increase their profits on average by 15 to 20%. My understanding is like, it's the kind of thing that you just have to set up once. And then it's Correct. done. Like once, once you, you got to sit down. Yeah, it might take you half a day to set up the bank accounts and set up the little bits and pieces, and you know, train your team on how to do it. Because this is not the right. This is not the thing for a business owner to do. This is something for you to delegate to your finance team to manage. But it's 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 something that you hand off. Exactly. And you might have to do it in the beginning whilst you're getting used to it. But then once we've got mm -hmm. the system mapped out, we can definitely hand it off. And the reality is, this should take you less than 15 minutes a month to manage. And if you don't have 15 minutes to increase your profitability by on average 15 to 20%, then maybe there's something wrong. So it's a pretty good return on investment. We go back to James's, uh, James's analogy of his formula, right? 15 minutes to increase profit by 15 to 20%, and that's a pretty good deal. So the next step is once we've got a finger on the pulse in terms of cash flow, we then need to start understanding the levers that we can pull to increase profit and cash flow, right? Because what I found in my experience, and I'm sure you've seen this too, Peter, is that most business owners don't charge what they're worth. Typically got a kind of a, a finger in the, the sky kind of way of their pricing. They're doing things based on trading time for money. They're not really sure of their real true cost to serve. And for that reason, they typically are pretty gun shy in terms of increasing their price. And what we've got to realize is that most businesses pull one single lever to grow their business, which is more volume, mm -hmm. more clients, more clients, more clients, more clients. And it's so expensive to acquire new clients. 
because it's, mm. it's getting so competitive out there. People have the ability to do a lot of research. And for that reason, when you take on a new client, it's very costly because you've got to onboard those people and, and start delivering that service. So it's actually one of the lowest margin parts of your business. Mm. But what if you could understand the other levers that you could pull in your business and the sensitivity of those levers to help you increase your profit and cash flow? Mm. Like what would a 10% increase in price do to your profitability mm. and cash flow over 12 months? What would a 5% reduction in cost of sales do to your cap profit and cash flow? What would a 2% adjustment in operating expenses do to your profit and cash flow? What if getting your, your clients to pay you five days sooner on your payment terms do for your cash flow? Or no, negotiating your suppliers to pay them five days later? And it's understanding the impact that these things have to your buckets that can help you drastically increase not only your profit, but your cash that you put into the bank account. Yeah, and they're, they're just small levers to change. They don't have to be drastic changes, but a lot of small adjustments and small levers moved can really compound into large changes. Exactly. Like to give you an example, I had a client recently that where we modeled this, we looked at a 10% increase in volume and they were a business that was doing a profit of about half a million dollars a year. So it was a pretty sizable business. And we said, okay, you could increase your volume by 10%. And that would be an increase in profit of about 150 grand. But wow. if they increase their price by 10%, that would be an increase in 200 grand. So wow. their price had a substantially higher sensitivity to their profit and cash flow than increasing volume. And of course, if we can do both, that's amazing. That's an increase of about $350,000 in terms of profit and cash flow. But then the other, uh, the, the other part to this, and I think many business owners don't really consider this, Pete, is what impact do these things have on the valuation of your business? Yeah. Because I guess in your experience, mate, when you, because obviously you help guide your, your clients with creating systems and, and solutions that help them run more efficiently, which has a massive impact on their ability to sell their business. So they're not just relying on, on spreadsheets and, and doing things manually. How often do you find that your clients are thinking about preparing their business for sale? I, I wouldn't say ever, really. I think it's kind of like a pipe dream for most business owners. And I yeah. don't think it's you know necessarily the way, like if you're a small business owner in Australia and, and you know typically we, a lot of our customers are like kind of Gen X or, or baby boomer generation business owners. And they're very happy to keep the business running because they like what they do or they really love working with their team. And so I, I don't really like kind of judge or shame anyone on, 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 you know, on where they want to go exit wise. However, what I do notice is that plenty of those business owners are chained to the business like a job. And so I like to use the analogy of, you know, imagine that your job is the mechanic and you're outside the business, like you're a consultant to the business and your job is to tweak the machine and to get that machine running nicely and hopefully just spitting out cash all day long. And for people to get in that frame of mind in terms of like the systems, they might say, oh, well, if I'm the boss, then I can, some of these jobs only I can do. You know, only I can like, you know, approve the finance or only I can do this thing or only I can meet with the key customers. And it's like, yes. And if you think about a publicly traded company on the Australian Securities Exchange, well, they swap out CEOs all the time. Now, whether or not those companies perform is another story, but there is the ability to swap out a competent operator into a executive position to actually come in and run a business. And I'm in the position right now where I'm literally transitioning out of the active CEO role of IT Genius and moving to a group role across the different businesses that we support and own. And for me, I have Scott Galatly, who's been our general manager for the last 18 months, stepping into that CEO role. And because the systems and the processes have been set up in place and we've got an amazing team in place, there's not much that he needs to kind of take off me because things mostly run pretty darn well themselves. And so that's the idea. It doesn't mean that you have to step back and employ a CEO or someone else to run the business, although you may choose to, what it means is you want to be in that frame of mind. And there's a great quote by Jim Collins, who wrote one of my favorite books called Good to Great. And that quote is, a great business only continues to be great if it is so without the founder. If yes. your business would collapse in a stack of cards without you there, then it's not really a business. And I've seen some business owners who, you know, there's like one person in the middle, they're the shining light, and there's 20 assistants around them. It's not, a, it's not actually a business with structure. It's just one right. person with a whole bunch of people, you know, following their whirlwind. And typically these are the founder types, creative founder types who don't have a solid integrator who can actually like, you know, put, actually implement and deploy and manage and roll out the systems and processes. 
So that comes from a concept called rocket fuel and a number of other books that talk about that. But you really need a great team around you who can support that. And, it, and you know, like, let's say right now you're a sole operator. The business that we've just become involved in is a primarily a coaching business and there's heaps of sole operators there. And if that's you, you might be thinking, well, does that mean that I have to hire like five people for a team? Like it's easy for you, Pete, because you've got a million staff and blah, 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 blah. It doesn't necessarily mean that a, a supporter for you as a sole operator might be one person who works for you a couple of hours a day or one person who works for you three half days a week and they catch the balls that you throw or maybe they do the things that you're really not great at. I'm really not great at folding my clothes and putting them away in the cupboard. I'll leave that for weeks and weeks and weeks. So I have someone who comes and does that for me so I don't have to worry about that and I get more time to focus on the things that I love doing and that I'm really great at doing. 